I want to talk about the trade war with China. It's had a drastic effect on North Carolina farmers, from soybean farmers to uh, hog farmers. We sell a lot of these products to China. What would your plan be to help rectify this issue if the trade war continues with China? That's a great question. And yes, our farmers are hurting. And so now adding COVID-19 on top of that and double digit drops on the international commodity market for so many of the top crops that North Carolinians grow has been absolutely just a, a point of heartache for so many farmers throughout North Carolina. And so in addition to worrying about what's happening with hogs and with soybeans, which had an additional tariff imposed on them, um, tobacco. The tobacco market in particular has really, really suffered as a result of this trade war with China. You know, North Carolina is one of the top growers in the nation of tobacco. And Eastern North Carolina in particular, um, you know, absolutely grows and produces some of the best fl flu curd flu cured, excuse me, tobacco in the whole entire nation. And the idea that they no longer largely have a trading partner with China, which is where we were sending the majority of our tobacco, means that a lot of growers can't continue to participate in that market. Um, you know, for some of them, their whole entire ability to, to farm and keep the land that's been in their families for generation is absolutely at risk. And you know, I think a really good starting point when you wanna talk about how we begin to fight back and combat this trade war is making sure that we are electing a commissioner who is not sitting on the campaign committee for President Trump, um, the very person who continually has engaged with China and, and gotten us deeper and deeper into this trade war. I mean, if you've looked at the timeline of the trade war starting in March 2018, it is a back and forth. It is an absolute back and forth between China saying one thing, then the U.S. retaliates back and forth, back and forth. And that is absolutely devastating to the North Carolina economy. It's absolutely devastating to our farmers and their long term ability to be economically successful doing what they love to do, which is farm. Not only are they dealing with COVID-19 and the trade war with China, they're dealing with climate change, right. uh, suffering a lot from flooding and storms, especially in the last decade or so. How do you mitigate that? Well, first of all, I'm really glad that you brought this up because I know that climate change is indeed real. This is a point in which my opponent and I differ greatly. Um, and you know, I would contend that climate change is absolutely the root cause of so many of the issues that our farmers are facing, changing their harvest dates, changing their yields, changing their long-term ability to be productive and ensure their long-term economic success. So it's a dereliction of duty on behalf of the current commissioner that he refuses to recognize the effects of climate change and do something about it. It's also a dereliction of duty on his part to making sure that we're protecting our consumers in North Carolina who depend on a long-term supply of food and fiber. Because, you know, put, put simply, no farms means no food. And my opponent basically said that one of his biggest accomplishments in 15 years in this office is getting Democrats and Republicans to agree to cut relief checks to farmers after the last few major storm events. Now, I'm not gonna argue that those farmers didn't need that money. They absolutely did, but they needed it because he was derelict in his duty and using all the tools and resources available to him from this position of power to meaningfully mitigate the effects of natural disasters on our farmers. And that's why I know that writing a relief check can't be our only solution to dealing with natural disasters. And I have a plan to create a division within the North Carolina Department of Agriculture that works to specifically address climate change and build resiliency into our farm and community planning to connect the dots between, between renewables, between our agribusinesses, between our breweries and vineyards, between all of our farmers. Because right now, not doing anything about this issue is not only not environmentally unsustainable, it's not economically sustainable. I mean, there are apple orchard owners up west that have had a hard time getting crop insurance because blooming seasons are no longer predictable. There are coastal fisher people who don't know what their next yield is gonna look like because of changing storm currents. This is an issue that we have to address, otherwise there will not be a future in agriculture. One of the things I'm sure that you've heard plenty of, and I certainly have, is that farmers don't want to check, they just want to work, they just want to farm. Right, right. I mean, farmers are some of the hardest working people there are. They're working long hours, toiling under a hot sun or in cold breezes, and they're doing that knowing that there's a lot of overhead and a very low profit margin. And every single time we turn around, there's a new trade war or tariffs being imposed that make their job even harder. And so, you know, 
for me, something that's absolutely crucial in my campaign is making sure that we can put rural North Carolinians back to work, that we're giving our farmers access to every resource necessary in order to be successful and do what they love to do, which is farm. We certainly have seen farmers over the decades and centuries change course in what they grow, right? Uh, we saw that with tobacco. A lot of tobacco farmers became, uh, had started growing grapes for, and had a vineyard and had their own line of wine. Um, one other option could be, if made legal, marijuana. Where do you stand on that? Should marijuana uh, be legalized in the state of North Carolina? And do you see it as an answer for some farmers who just can't find the right path for themselves? Absolutely. So I'm in support of the legalization of cannabis, both medicinally and recreationally. I understand that I would have to work with the legislature in order to make sure that that happens. Um, but, you know, the commissioner right now is responsible for directing and uh, over 75 different laws on the books. Uh, and so this would be no different. This is a law that would absolutely make a difference in, in the well-being of our agricultural industry to be successful in the long term. You know, the reality is, is that cannabis is already legal in 33 states plus D.C., so it's not really a question of if it's going to happen, it's a question of when it's going to happen. And when it does, I'm committed to making sure that we have a just and equitable industry that actually works for the small farmers that call North Carolina home. I want to make sure that licenses are affordable. I want to make sure that black farmers, female farmers, veteran farmers have the ability to have a piece of this pie. Um, you know, I want to make sure that we're giving our farmers every opportunity to compete in this market. We've lost something like 98% of the tobacco trading market to China in recent years. So, you know, Democrats, Republicans, independents, whoever I've talked to, they're interested in pursuing this economic opportunity. But not just that, you know, the ability of cannabis to absolutely change rural economies is astounding. So, you know, we're a state that depends on travel and tourism revenue. But as a result of COVID-19, people aren't traveling and touring. And we're seeing massive budget shortfalls throughout the state. You know, I think that our budget should absolutely reflect our values and priorities in society. If you want to fund the things that matter, like public education, and I know as someone who was the product of a Title I school, my sister teaches at a Title I school right now, um, someone who was able to attend the North Carolina School of Science and Math before going to NC State, I know that strong public schools create opportunity and equity in places where sometimes there isn't any other opportunity. So let's fund that. Let's do that with the money that we bring in through cannabis. Same thing with funding public transit and mental health counseling. Um, you know, rural communities in particular have been absolutely crippled by the opioid epidemic. Let's think about medicinal marijuana as a form of health care for seniors with chronic health conditions, for people suffering with anxiety and depressive disorders, for some children with rare seizure disorders. But perhaps most excitingly, the thing about cannabis legalization is I believe it is an opportunity to begin to achieve true social justice for communities of color that have been disproportionately criminalized and locked up on the basis of possession charges versus Caucasian users for far too long, despite the fact that the data shows us that white folks and black folks are using cannabis at roughly the same rate. And you can't tell me that it is not a social justice and social equity issue that right now there are black men sitting in prison for doing something that's legal in a propensity of other states, and now they're more likely to contract COVID-19. I want to talk about generational farming. You grew up on a farm. Uh, generational farming, not a thing these days. It's, it's hard to find families um, whose grandson is likely to take over the business. 100 years ago, it would be no question. How do you approach that? Because, you know, it's such a part of North Carolina culture. That's why we have Tobacco Road, right? That's why all of the colleges and universities were allegedly located along Tobacco Road. Tobacco built this state, um, as did Cotton. So, you know, as someone who grew up on a family farm that was my grandparents, my grand great-grandparents before that were also involved in agriculture, my parents, um, although, you know, my parents had to work a different job because, again, the, the income just wasn't there from the family farm. Now I do the same thing. I help farm on our family's farm out in Johnston County. Um, I help manage operations with my father. We rent the bulk of the farm, but I have to pursue another line of work in order to bring in a steady income. And part of that is because we've had a lack of leadership in this industry, not just on the state level, but on the federal level for so long that we're not pursuing new economic opportunities that allow a whole new generation of people to be excited about participating in this industry. But I think we have the opportunity to do that this year with this election. How much of that has to do with outreach? Part of it with outreach and education, right? Um, so within the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, there's actually a marketing department that I believe that we could use more efficiently and effectively. You know, when I talk about the importance of, of extending broadband throughout the state, 
um, you know, that is a way that we go about expanding opportunities and information and access to information about farmers who are doing some great work. Um, you know, but we have to teach farmers how to use that technology efficiently. The average age of the farmer in North Carolina is about two years older than what it is nationally. So it's not enough to just give them the tools uh, to, to participate in the online market. We have to show them how to do it. Uh, not just that, we have to make farming exciting for, for young folks. I want to put a garden on every school ground. I want us to, to really further invest in environmental and agricultural education programming in our schools and inspire a whole new generation to get involved in this industry. Social probably has a lot to do with that too, social media. Absolutely. I do want to ask you about the TikTok video. Sure. Uh, it's certainly gone viral. Uh, in it, you said, on a scale of one to 10, is this your favorite or most favorite October surprise? And that was in regards to President uh, Trump's COVID-19 diagnosis. There's been some criticism. Um, can you explain where you were coming from? And you know, do you understand the criticism? So I'm absolutely happy to talk about this video. I will tell you that I still don't think that this is newsworthy. I don't think it was newsworthy last week. Um, but, you know, I absolutely defined what an October surprise was, which is indeed something that occurs in October generally to a candidate um, as a result of human action. And I said in this case, rather human, act, human inaction on, the, on behalf of a president who, by the way, from day one did not take this virus seriously, even using racist nomenclature such as the Wuhan flu or the China virus until all of a sudden he himself contracted COVID-19. And despite being in a position of power where he could, he could have forcefully pushed for the dissemination of PPE, of uh, encouraging mask wearing and encouraging testing early on, he did not. And I think that that is the real news story that we should be talking about. The fact that Senator Tom Tillis was the first to criticize me and throw stones despite the fact that he and members of the Senate, his colleagues have let the HEROES Act sit on the Senate floor since May, I think is absolutely reprehensible. These people had the tools and access to a, a platform and position of power where they could have meaningfully mitigated the effect on the people of, of this country. Instead, we have over 200,000 Americans who are dead, millions and more who have been sick, and the GOP just used this as a way to distract from their party who is in power and had that had that ability to, to help people who are hurting. They just use this as a way to distract from that. And so I think that that is what we should really be talking about. The fact that the video wasn't properly contextualized, it is um, you know, appropriate for a medium like TikTok. I mean, yeah, if I could have done all of this again, would I have filmed the video? No, but what I said is absolutely true in that there are over 200,000 Americans that are dead because of a lack of action from the president. Well, and one of the reasons I do have to ask you to respond is that it's still on Steve Trockler's campaign website, and he does criticize you in it and suggest certain things. So I did want to be fair enough to ask no, you to respond. Absolutely. And I will tell you, as a result of that video and his party continuing to, to make a deal out of it, I have received numerous death threats. I have had um, my own personal safety and well-being, as, as well as that of my parents, my families, my staffs, threatened. People have threatened to cut my brake lines. I haven't been able to sleep at my home in over a week and a half. Um, and that, I believe, is absolutely deplorable and reprehensible. People have attacked my sexuality. Um, and it's just been an unending, an unending uh, cycle of, of just violence and ugliness from the other side. And so whether or not you thought that I should have filmed the video, I can't imagine anyone thinking it is okay to issue death threats against me or people who are involved in this campaign. Has law enforcement been made aware of these threats? They were absolutely made aware of these threats, but they also said that unless someone directly says that they are going to kill me then, or, or punch me in the face, then these aren't actual threats unless, you know, even though we understand the intention of them to be to be of a threatening nature. I want to go back to something you did mention, you know, in, in your response in regards to COVID. Certainly a huge challenge in the field for, for growers and for those who come and pick, for those who sort um, to mitigate the issue of the COVID threat, social distancing, mask, a, a whole new thing, not just in the field, but also in the processing plants. Right, so I've talked a lot about our farm workers. Um, you know, even though the actual commissioner doesn't have any say over immigration policy, that's a federal issue, 
Uh, I think having a loud vocal advocate in the room makes a big difference. I believe that the people who pick our food, the people who are the backbone of the agricultural industry, the people who are the reason why, by the way, you can put food on your table and clothes on your backs, I believe that those people deserve a moral pathway to citizenship. And I think that a truly great America would have already addressed the immigration crisis instead of treating it like a pest problem. And now what you are seeing with these workers, many of whom are undocumented, almost all are underpaid, underappreciated, don't have access to medical care or treatment, or who are too scared to seek access to medical care or treatment if they're here on an H-2A visa and they're scared that if they take a day off of work, their employers will retaliate or they will lose their source of income that they or their families back home are depending upon. Um, I think it is absolutely critical that we talk about the lack of access to PPE, especially early on in these meatpacking plants. You saw the outbreaks, everybody saw the news. Um, or the lack of these you know, meatpacking plants putting up glass shields or separating workers. Have you ever been in a meatpacking plant? Oh yeah. It is a physically demanding and intensive job. You are working very rapidly. In some cases, you are slitting the throats of hogs a thousand per hour, and you're not supposed to let that, that, that line slow down. Um, again, you could potentially face retaliation. And so I think it is absolutely so upsetting and devastating what is happen, happening, the fact that we are not you know, considering the humanity of, in, in the policies that we are actually enacting. So a few weeks ago in September, the CDC issued guidance. And I never thought there would be a time in my life where I would be disagreeing with the CDC, but this just goes to show you that facts and science are absolutely on the ballot this fall. Um, the CDC issued guidance basically stating that farm workers are considered essential agricultural employees, and as such, they are to continue reporting to work if they are allegedly asymptomatic, even if they've been exposed to someone with COVID-19. My opponent, Steve Troxler, signed guidance a few weeks ago stating the same, that he agrees with that CDC guidance. What's very interesting is, again, we are prioritizing the corporate profit margins, um, many of whom, you know, of these corporate entities, by the way, are donors of my opponent, over the actual humanity and dignity of the workers who are making sure that it's possible to put food on the, food on the table. And, you know, it's ridiculous to think that an outbreak of COVID-19 amongst the farm worker population doesn't affect the larger population of a city, state, or community as a whole. Um, you know, while farm workers are in danger every single day, it is easy for someone who sits in an office to say, no, 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 they should continue reporting to work. But these folks have to go home and then expose their family to other, while they've been around, other people who may have come in contact with COVID-19. I mean, I just think it's absolutely devastating and it's in, inhumane what's happening right now. I know you've hit on this a lot. This is my last question for you throughout the process of this interview, but I, 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 in a nutshell, how do you distinguish yourself from Commissioner Troxler? This race, this election, is about taking an industry that's largely been left in the past and moving it into the future. It's about creating a more just, sustainable, and equitable future for every single person who calls North Carolina home, not just the select few who got a corporate campaign pack check. My election, my race, is about choosing someone who understands that climate change is real and is ready to meaningfully act to, to help our farmers, to help our consumers, to mitigate the effects of natural disasters in the future. This election is about choosing someone who knows that Black Lives Matter and Black Farmers Matter, absolutely, and without any caveats, and is going to do everything they can to support the black farming community versus my opponent, who, you know, is the largest recipient of campaign cash from the racist Sons of Confederate Veterans Heritage Pack. It is about electing someone who wants to help small farmers and who isn't beholden to corporate, out-of-state, or international big ag or organizations. It's about creating a future that works for every single person in this state that prioritizes equality, that, that fights for our farm workers. And I think that's a future that most people want to live in. And I hope that you know when they go to the ballot this fall, that's the future they vote for.